everyone to another week of the Premier League Review Show, uh, the football show on the Global Sports Channel. We've got some great guests this week. We're covering week 26 in the EPL, but we are also have a special guest that's going to talk about buying clubs and investing in the European leagues. And we're excited to talk to him back. Welcome him back. First up, Darren McCauley, player at Coleraine, Derry, Celtic United, also Inverness, and currently with Dynamo Albans in Melbourne. We're excited to welcome you back, Darren. Nice to have you. Thanks for having me, David. Uh, introducing once again, welcoming back Mike Sutton, owner of the Auckland Huskies. And on a football note, I think he's more proud to be a lifelong supporter of Arsenal, as well as president of his local side, Surfside Waves. And uh, always exciting to have you back because we get into some banter and it's a lot of fun. So welcome back, Mike. Thanks, Dave. And I, I think I'm more proud to be president of Surfside Waves than I am to be an Arsenal fan, to be honest, at the moment. But uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> well, that's going to be uh, yeah evident when we cover some of the games. But I'd love to introduce you to this week's special guest, owner and investor of several teams in Europe. He is owner, co-owner of the Danish first division side, Helsingor. He is also a minority investor at Swansea City in the championship. And he is also owner of Dundalk, who Mike and Darren, I'm sure, familiar, especially Darren, because I believe, Darren, you've played against Dundalk uh, in your playing career so far. And that is Jordan Gardner. Welcome, Jordan. Thanks for having me, guys. Looking forward to it. Great. So let's get started. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, obviously, the investments amount needed to be in the American big leagues. We're talking the NBA, the NFL, NBA, um, and Major League Baseball, excuse me. Um, that's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Maybe if I put a figure on it, anywhere from four to five hundred million dollars. Uh, if you look at the cost of getting in maybe 15 years ago to the MLS, it was a lot lower. And then obviously you had this 400 to 500 percent just continual just increase of cost to get in. And you don't have the attractiveness of the the media rights deals that are happening in Europe. So is part of that attractiveness to looking at maybe some of the smaller countries, the first division sides or the second division sides in some of these smaller countries? Is it centered around the attractiveness of the media deals that you see over uh, in some of these smaller countries or smaller markets? Because of now India and China and the Middle East, you've got some amazing deals being done, uh, even by my side, Leeds United, uh, Rad Razani, when we were in the championship, um, he leveraged his experience in the media side of the business. And uh, it's been great for Leeds United because he's now reinvesting some of that money in the stadium, uh, signing up deals with Adidas and so forth. So I wanted to turn it over to you, Jordan, and ask about media deals. What about that but first of all what attracted you to the first side go back to the first side you invested in and what attracted you to uh getting into the european market yeah no um i had been involved with a couple clubs uh on the kind of executive side here in the u.s and um, i got connected to the ownership group at swansea city this was in 2018 when the club was in the premier league mm -hmm. and they were looking for a very small uh equity infusion and you know for me there was a couple of reasons why i was attractive a was, hey this is awesome i can go sit in the owner's box at a premier league game and i did that five or six or seven times 
Um, but also it was about important if I was going to have bigger aspirations in European football, which I did have and do have in terms of having this kind of entrepreneurial background. Um, I felt like it was really important to avoid the mistakes that a lot of American ownership and foreign ownership groups have made in European football and come in and bought a big club and really had, didn't have a good sense of, uh, how to run these businesses and these clubs properly. And so I felt it was really valuable for me to be a very, very small part of an ownership group and, and go through that process. And, you know, unfortunately that year, 2018, Swansea city got relegated that year. Yeah, so yeah. that was, that was, you know, not good from anyone's perspective, but um, I think it was a really good learning curve to understand as an American, what that relegation process is like. I mean, you can talk about it on a piece of paper, but until you actually go through it, it's a totally different ball game. So I think from that perspective, it was really interesting. I think, you know, to your question about smaller European clubs and media rights, um, you know, yes, of course, you know, our club in Denmark, we do, there is a decent sized television deal and that is important. Um, I do think the smaller clubs in general are probably more player development focused. Um, I think that's where the huge commercial upside can be is on the player development side. Um, you know, I think the bigger leagues have larger media rights deals. So I think that's where it can be more attractive. So I think to answer your question, I think it'd be a little bit more player focused per se than media rights focused. Before I turn it over to the other guys to ask some questions, I wanted to go back to what you just said in terms of our player development. So part of that is uh, academies, of course, building academies, uh, but also, um, so, you know, your, your transfers and so forth. So um, how much of that is, first of all, building the academies? Uh, and second of all, within that, when to pull the trigger on, selling on your best players, but also retaining that talent. So you're not depleting the center of your squad. Yeah. I mean, it's a delicate balance in terms of kind of understanding the right time to, to sell your players. Cause they're an asset that kind of comes and goes player has a good couple of games. That could be very valuable. They have a couple of games after they might not be as valuable. Um, you know, what's interesting for us in Helsinger a bit is we have a very young academy. So the academy has only started three years ago. So it's a little bit difficult because we're obviously continuing to invest heavily where you know, we're not really getting huge returns in terms of players or certainly players that can either play for our first team or can we can sell. So it's a little bit of a different challenge for us. I think, you know, fast forwarding three to five years from now when the club is churning out good players, you know, it's about making sure those players get the time they need to develop and can be moved on. I think some clubs I've seen at times can hold on for players for too long. And then it's, it's a not good for their development because they psychologically don't want to be at that club anymore, but B their value can depreciate. And, or I've seen clubs just say, Hey, we're not selling you. And the player leaves for a free transfer, right? There's clubs I've seen do that, which makes no sense to me. Yeah. So then all of a sudden, boom. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of different ways you can look at it. Thank you for that. Uh, Darren, Obviously, you, you've got a great perspective having, uh, obviously, as a player, uh, and you've played against Dundalk yourself. Um, what questions do you have for Jordan? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, yeah, Jordan, it's really, uh, it's really good to meet you. Um, and it's an opportunity that I've been looking for quite some time is to have a discussion with someone who isn't a coach but is heavily involved in the running of a club. Um, so I guess my first question to you would be, what are, the, what are the factors that make a club financially stable? What are the key factors in that process? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, obviously it's having good sound leadership and that starts at the top with ownership and it comes into budgeting and understanding, okay, how much are we spending on players this year and how much are we getting in in revenue and making sure you stick to those numbers. I think a lot of clubs see the bright lights when it comes to buying players and they overspend and they realize all of a sudden they've lost a lot of money. So I think that's one piece of the puzzle. And the other piece, which I think a lot of football clubs clearly undervalue is just bringing in good people. And that certainly can mean coaches, certainly can mean sporting directors, commercial staff, sales directors. I mean, if you can bring in good people and have a really good, well-run organization, you're going to have success. I mean, look at Brentford, for instance, is a very well-run club. Yeah. Uh, they should have got promoted last year. They very well may get promoted this year. They sell a ton of players. I mean, what's crazy to me about a club like Brentford is they sold 60 million pounds worth of players last year. And I think they're better this year than they were last year. That's so it's true. about long-term planning. And so all those things happen at a strategic board level. And it's about having 
sharp, savvy people that can make good sound business decisions. And unfortunately, in this industry and in this business in European football in particular, there's not a lot of that that goes on. It's very ego driven. You have billionaire owner who buys a club as a play toy and doesn't want to treat it like a business. So there's you know, you have the fans, right? Your customers are the fans. And if they're screaming at you that you're not spending enough on players, you kind of have to manage how forward facing your organization is publicly. So there's a lot of variables that go into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's great. That answers my question. Mike, um, obviously having, you know, existing right now as an owner of a sports team, uh, what questions do you have for, for Jordan? Yeah, well, I mean, well, obviously, you know, you, you um, when you're looking at the, the year, you look ahead, you're looking at the budget. I mean, that's the most important thing, as you've said, uh, Jordan, that, you know, is the club going to be sustainable and how long for and how do we make that, you know, a continuing pattern? And obviously revenue in, you know, is, is an extremely tough one. How have you found the commercial sponsorship space in um, in what's a very trying, you know, global economy for, for people that are, justifying a spend on sports clubs right now yeah it's tough i mean obviously covid has complicated that situation but even taking covid out of the situation i think commercially a lot of these football clubs in europe are very hyper local um i mean even clubs in the premier league you look at you know i see there's an american group at burnley right and they talk about Mm -hmm. we're going to internationalize the club and we're going to no you're not i mean you're burnley you're a small club maybe if you're tottenham or arsenal that's a separate conversation but outside the top 15 to 20 clubs in Europe, it's all about the mom and pop fish and chip shop down the street. And, you know, it's all very hyper local. And I think honestly, it's tough. And what's getting even more difficult, as you guys may have seen, is a lot of European leagues and countries are starting to ban uh, sponsorships from gambling companies. And so those are obviously have been huge revenue sources for clubs huge. on the commercial side, whether it's shirt sponsors or stadium sponsors. And so Spain is getting rid of it. I think there's talk in the UK about it. Uh, it's happened in Denmark as well, I believe. So it's very tough from the commercial side. There's no way around it. There's only so much you can do and your limitations are, they're there. Wow. What, I had a question, Jordan, uh, in terms of getting to know, you mentioned, I was, I was viewing one of your interviews recently and you talked about getting on the ground locally. It's important. You talked about big owners that millionaire owners that buy a club and then they just use it almost like a toy viewers or like a toy. Um, how much time do you, do you spend then? Uh, you, is it sort of heavy at the, f- the front end of this process to get on the ground and get into the local community, make your connections and so forth. Explain that process for the viewership in terms of getting involved at the local level initially and on a constant basis. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a lot of time before you buy a club, building those relationships during the due diligence phase. I think it's probably the first, let's say six to nine months after you buy the club. That's really important, especially if you're buying a club that's not in great shape and you're bringing a new staff. Um, You know, I've spent about two weeks a month on the ground in Denmark on and off for the last two years. It's slowed down because of COVID and the travel restrictions. You know, the club's in a really good place now. I have an American CEO on the ground who I know and trust and I can get on conference calls with him and do multiple times a day. Um, so it's, it's certainly about making sure you have people you trust on the ground, but those first six to nine months can be really challenging. And it's about meeting the local politicians, you know, meeting your biggest sponsors, you know, making sure there's a name to the face when it comes to your coaching staff, the players. I think, you know, I found the players are really receptive to engaged ownership. You know, I communicate with a lot of the players on Instagram. You know, we've, we've signed a couple of players since uh, in the winter window and I haven't been to Denmark to meet them. So I'll send them congratulations on Instagram. We just had a player have a baby. So I sent him a note on WhatsApp. Like, I don't think that kind of stuff happens very often at European football clubs. Again, we're a, we're a medium to smaller size club. So things are a little bit more accessible, but I think that human interaction can be really valuable for your, for an organization. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Darren, another question for Mike. I'm sorry. Uh, um, Jordan, excuse me. Yeah, I have a few questions for Mike too. You know, uh, as well, yeah, that will be later. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, Jordan, having played against uh, Dundalk a few times and and grew up in the League of Ireland, what is what is your vision for Dundalk as a club? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I'm just a minority shareholder. I've rolled off the board of Dundalk, so I'm not involved in the operations of the club anymore. So I can't necessarily speak to like what the future vision is for the club. What I can say is I think the league of Ireland and Irish football needs to be more professionalized. I think you have some very well run clubs at the top 
And um, I do think uh, obviously COVID has been challenging for that for a lot of clubs, but I think with Brexit, it's creating new opportunities for Irish clubs in terms of retaining talent longer and being able to monetize that. So I think there's a lot of potential on Irish foot that's going to continue to take growth out of the league. Um, you know, but I mean, Shamrock Rovers, Dundalk, you're still going to have big clubs that have your European aspirations. And I think that's always going to be the case. Yeah, that makes sense because some of the teams at the lower levels in Ireland or even the teams at the top level, but less down on the table, uh, they don't pay 52 weeks of the year, for example. And those little things are vital in, in making the league and the country more professional. Yeah, I mean, I think it would help. It, it's it's difficult, right? Because, um, you know, there's there's basically no television deal in Ireland. So it's a very small television deal. And so there's just not a lot of money to professionalize the clubs in terms of spreading out more longer, longer term contracts. So, you know, I think it, it, it comes down to the interest level in the sport, right? Everyone, when I was in Ireland, of course, you definitely have the bigger clubs are well supported, but most people are fans of Arsenal and Liverpool and Chelsea, right? And they're watching those games, they're watching Gaelic football. So I think it's about, in some ways, like the U.S., getting more groundswell of support for the domestic game in that country. And I think that's just going to take time. Uh, obviously, clubs like Dundalk and Shamrock Rovers doing well in European competition is really good for the sport in that country. Um, but it's just going to take time for it to grow in Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. And before I turn it over to Mike, uh, Jordan, um, Mike had a question before and it referenced COVID. Um, with situations like that, I know you're a minority investor in, and you're not on the board with Dundalk, but with the clubs that you've been involved in, either co-owned or being a minority investor in, um, What's the biggest effect COVID's had? Obviously, most people would think it's the fans not being able to be at the games. And what percentage does that affect, uh, you know, the, the revenue? I mean, uh, that's got to be a massive hit, man. Depends on the club, right? It depends on how heavily reliant you are on game day. Um, it can be upward of 30, 40, 50% of your revenue. I think, for instance, I'll give you guys a good example of beyond just game day. So in Denmark... Uh, throughout the fall season, we we were allowed by the government to have up to 500 spectators at the games, and that include include security and players and referees, which didn't enable us to sell tickets or really get any game day revenue, but it enabled us to give access to our corporate sponsors and and, and partners. So that enabled us to give them a really valuable asset, which is you can come to the games when no one else can. can. The government over the winter break said, we're done. We're not doing any fans at all. So it's down to zero. So now when we're having conversations with our sponsors, we have nothing to offer them. We can't give you access to the game. We can't give you a VIP hospitality. We can't give you business networking. We can't give you anything. And so they're saying like, look, like we love the club. We want to support the club, but like, we're not going to give you money for nothing. And so that's really hurt the sponsorship side of the business beyond just the ticketing side. So I think that's one piece. And then in Denmark, we had players test positive for COVID and we had players that miss games towards the end of our fall season and it hurt our results on the pitch. Um, I think there's no way around the fact that clubs that have had more players test positive had, have, you know, it's had effect on, uh, on the on-field performance. And so there's a lot of different ways it's affected the organizations. We're doing the best we can, but uh, it's tough. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I think it's been trying times for many clubs. Um, before I turn, uh, last question before I, I flip it to Mike is, um, you got promoted. Uh, this was your first season that you got promoted up from the previous, and then you, they'd also been promoted from the previous uh, division. So, um, is there? I'm not familiar as much with the Danish league. Obviously, when you go in the English league, you go from the Championship and you get promoted to the the Premier League. You get this sort of cash cow uh, in terms of transfer money. I'm sure it's massively different in the Danish first division, but is there a, 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 a somewhat an incentive as you get promoted in terms of? Yeah, no, there's more television revenue. Certainly that helps a lot. That is an incentive, I think, beyond putting COVID to the side, because that's had a pretty strong effect on the player transfer market. As you move up the the, the levels in Scandinavian football, the, the numbers you'll get for selling players just skyrockets, right? If you can have a player in a higher division prove themselves and let's say score 10 or 15 goals, they're going to sell for two or three or four X higher than they would doing that in a lower division, like any country, right? Mm -hmm. So those are, I think, the two main areas. I mean, certainly visibility for us being on national television in Denmark, um, the professionalization of the clubs we play, they're playing at bigger stadiums with bigger venues, visibility. So there's a lot of factors that go in. Financial is just one piece of it. Mike? 
Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. L last quick thing. Do you think the uh, there's a lot of talk about you know the fanless stadiums and the effect they're actually having on the games and the results? Do you think it neutralises the advantage that you know typically a Liverpool has when teams come there or you know you know the big the big clubs that have that huge home advantage? I think in a league like the Premier League, it does. It's leveled the playing field a bit. I think in other countries, let's say like Denmark, what's the difference is some uh, the quality of the stadiums and the infrastructure and the surfaces can be vastly different. So if we go out to the western part of the country, we play on artificial turf where we know we're going to be able to move the ball around. We can play. We can go out. And certainly this time of the year, too, we have to go play on a shit grass pitch. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pitches are frozen also in Scandinavia. So whether there's fans in the game or not, that's going to completely affect the way we play. And it's going to put us a team that plays on turf at a significant competitive disadvantage. So I think it depends on the league and the type of surfaces and the way that works. But in our case, like it hasn't changed that much in terms of road versus home advantage. I haven't looked at the data for the Premier League, but you know, all the, all the stadiums and the surfaces in the Premier League are pretty standard. So I can't see it being a huge, huge difference there. Great. Darren, another question for Jordan? Sure. Yeah, you've came across a variety of different managers, I'm sure, from Swansea, Ireland, Denmark and the States. Um, so for you, what impresses you most? What characteristics impress you most in coaches and managers? What do you find attractive? What do you find puts you off? Another good question. I, I think too many people in and around the sport are so focused on coaches that are tactical genius geniuses or coaches that have some sort of, um, you know, uh, focus on statistical, you know, that, they, that they, they're really doing things at a different level when it comes to data and statistics and that kind of stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's great, but I'm a firm believer that coaches uh, that build culture and motiv motivate men are as important, if not more important. So, so you look at Bielsa at Leeds, right? I mean, he has a system he plays and it's a really sound system and he, fits players for that but like he motivates men people love players either love it or hate it but the ones that stay love playing for that guy and it works and so when i sat down with a you know hiring a coach let's say for denmark i hired a coach specifically that you know was focused on building culture had a background both in coaching in the danish super league but also had a background in human resources had knew how to motivate men and so i think people sometimes in the sport forget that it's, it's a team sport, interpersonal relationships between the players, between the coaching staff, they're really important. And especially for a club like ours in Denmark, where we're one of the lowest spending teams in our division, like we need to craft a model where the sum is greater than the parts because we're not going to be able to outspend anyone. And so having a coach that can build culture, can build up players, can help, you know, uh, develop young players into where we want them to be and eventually sell them, I think was, is really important. And we got very lucky to find a coach that fits all that. Yeah, I agree. One of the most important things for me as a player was was and is my relationship with the manager and how he makes us feel and the ability to make players believe in themselves and to come on board with the project is much more important than the tactical side of things. Not that I'm dismissing that tactical side, but I definitely agree that that ability to motivate men get them on your side is is vital. Yep, I agree. Is that, so Jordan, is that the hardest decision when things aren't working out in the first year of hiring a new manager, um, whether to stick with that manager or pull the plug? I mean, in Leeds's case, before Radrazani took over, we had the, uh, the coach eater or the manager eater in uh, Massimo Cellino and, uh, you know, going through, burning through 20 managers, his average at clubs uh, is just, to me, it's, it's not a very stable approach. What's your take yeah. on that? I mean, you see Schalke, I think Schalke in the Bundesliga has gone through five different managers this year already, and there's no surprise that they're going to get relegated. Um, look, I think on one hand, you have to be decisive. If you make a decision and you hire a manager who isn't the right guy for whatever reason, and you need to make a change, you should make that decision quickly and decisively. Um, so I think that's important. But on the other hand, I think stability is key, and that comes into the leadership characteristics as well. Um, so I think it's difficult. It's kind of, you kind of have to take it on a case by case basis, but I think any club that is constantly firing coaches is never going to have success, like period, end of story. 
Yeah, great, thank you. Mike, another question for Jordan? No, I'm just keen to, to talk about the Arsenal game, to be honest. Yeah, we're going to shift over in a second. I have one more thing and we'll get into the games because you've got Arsenal, Man U and Leeds fan. And we've got to ask you, in the Premier League, who's your team, Jordan? Who's your team? Uh, so I know a lot of the guys, uh, there's a lot of Americans involved in the ownership group at Leeds. Uh, a couple of guys that I'm close with here yes. that are tied in with the 49ers. Um, so I, I definitely pull for them. Obviously, Chelsea a bit with Pulisic. Um so those are uh, full in with the American ownership group, but I would say probably Leeds is the club that I, I watch the most. We're just going to end the show now. We have to end the show now, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, let's cut it off there. Nice to meet you, Jordan. <laughs> yeah. You're not that invited back, by the way, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was really terrific. Um, appreciate it, Jordan. If you're up for it, we'd love to have you back and yeah. continue the conversation. Yeah, I'm happy to. And again, sorry for all the noise in the background, same doorbell stuff, so sorry about that. No, I apologize for the doorbell, so we're even. And uh, you made my day and that you're uh, supporting Leeds. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you again cool. for coming on. Thanks. This week's games uh, kicked off on Saturday. Man City winners in a great game, I thought, uh, against West Ham. Um, the Hammers were in it. The Hammers were in it. 2-1 winners, Man City. They go on a 19-game win streak. It's just absolutely insane, this run. Ruben Diaz put him ahead, but then Mikel Antonio equalised right before half-time. And John Stones with the winner in the 68th minute. But i got to say, guys, more shots on goal. But again, as Darren always says, it's not the shots on goal, it's the conversions. I thought West Ham were a bit unlucky to lose this game. I thought it was one of the best games of the week. West Bromwich Albion winners, they needed this one. 1-0 one at Brighton Hove Albion. Uh, they were host, actually. Kyle Bartley, ex-Leeds player. Great ex-Leeds player, I thought. And he was scored the winner in the 11th minute. And I have to say, I was bumming with the performance of Leeds United this week. A losers at home to Aston Villa. Shocking display. El Ghazi, they deserved it. Poor marking again from Leeds. I have to say, guys, Leeds, they've only given up. Only one side in the whole division, West Bromwich Albion, has given up more goals than Leeds and only four sides in the division have scored more and nobody has less draws than Leeds United so what does that tell you like you said before when we lose we go down in flames and when we win we're scoring quite a bit of goals so uh, did you guys see the match it was quite a bit of a bore really to be honest with you and uh, I don't know if you want to add something briefly because I didn't think it was the game of the week but what's your take on the ups and downs of Leeds. No, just quickly, I, I did watch the game. It was a funny game, really. I don't think the other team dominated. It was a, it was, it was a transition game that sort of went nowhere. Seemed that way. I think it, all that says about Leeds, what, the stats you quote there, is just their style of play. You know, it's just what Bielts is about. And to tell him to tighten up and do this and do that, I'm not sure he will. I think he'll just keep executing until he gets perfection in the way he wants to play. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't right now. Yeah, and I think we'll finish mid-table. I'll be happy if we stay in mid-table. If we can stay around 11th place, that's, I think, exceeding expectations going into the season. Quick thing, Darren, I know you like Bielsa's style of play, but obviously you're not a fan of Leeds, and uh, you've already said it. We, we're going to give up serious amount of goals usually when we lose. Quick thing on the game, yeah. did you see it? Was it a bore for you or uh, just one of those things? I think in terms of a Leeds game, it was it, it was boring, but that doesn't necessarily mean it, it is boring because they are such an exciting side. They do have a unique style of play. Um, and as you say, whenever they go down, they go down in flames. And when they're firing on all cylinders, it's great to watch. Uh, but I'm still impressed by uh, Rafinha. I just think he's, he's so electric. Um, he's so quick. He just has that spark. When when he's on the ball, something just seems to happen. 
Yeah, I think he's one of the best signings. And I think, as I said before, in the last uh, discussion that we had a few days ago, that once we get healthy bodies back, we're talking Phillips. Without Phillips, we've lost all but one game where Phillips has not featured. So that says a lot. We're missing Calvin Phillips, that defensive midfielder role, strike filling that gap doesn't work for me. Uh, you've got Diego, Diego Lorente came back, one of the healthy centre-backs finally, but that's going to take some time. So he'll, he gets up to speed, which you mentioned, Darren. When a player returns from injury, it usually takes a few games to get up to speed. Let's move on, guys. Newcastle was a 1-1 draw against Wolves. Wolves is one of those up and down teams. 13 shots on goal for Newcastle, 11 shots on goal for Wolves. I thought it was an exciting game. Sunday came around. It was Crystal Palace with another board draw. Nil-nil at home to Fulham. Uh, I don't know how Fulham ended up you know, tying this game. They had 14 shots on goal, four, four on target. One shot by Crystal Palace, a big nil with shots on target. Uh, I don't know. Fulham, I think, will come around, like we said. And on to the game of the week for Mike. 3-1 winners away to Leicester City. 56% possession. I thought they looked good. I'm surprised with this up and down performance by Leicester City. I don't understand with starting Luke Thomas, Mark Albrighton sitting on the bench. Such a bad performance by Luke Thomas that he comes off at half time. David Luiz in the 39th minute with the equaliser because what was shocking was boom. Thielmans puts them up in the sixth minute. You think, oh boy, this is going to be a disaster for Arsenal. And yet, boom, right before half time, the penalty by Lacazette, the momentum shifts, and then up pops Nicolas Pepe with the winner in the 52nd minute. Let's go to Mike. What was your thoughts on the game? Uh, and you started Aubameyang on the bench, which was a bit surprising, but Lacazette gets. On the, on the score sheet via the penalty. Let's go with Mike and your opinion on the game. Yeah, I mean, you can look back on it and say it was brilliant strategy and the result was never in doubt at the end. But I think you saw an interesting Arsenal shape, an interesting lineup um, when you get Pepe and Willian in, in the same team in Lacazette. I think we've seen, I could be wrong, but that exact 3-0 trio playing together like that. Um, and I think what we saw was the the best and the worst of David Luiz. You know, their first goal was, if you look at it, was his fault. Um, yeah, he doesn't get back. He creates all sorts of problems for his, his his colleagues at the back there. They don't know who to cover. They've got Vardy as a constant threat. And um, in he goes for a brilliant goal. He ran from nearly the halfway line to receive that ball. And and um, I forget who it was, but the, the other centre-back uh, was was really struggling, didn't know which way to go. And that was, that was Luiz's fault. Uh, that's typical him. And then, you know, he, he, he also had then moments of brilliance, um, kept the side in it, did some brilliant tracking back and looked after Vardy at times and, and scores. So we're able to win, but a surprising result. I, I couldn't, I can't tell you how happy he was because I thought we were going to get smashed. Um, and yeah, the I worst case, I'll tell you what, the worst thing about that win is, the worst thing about that win is that it helped Manchester United. It helps Manchester United. Yeah, in terms of uh, point differential, you mean? Correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was mildly a little bit disappointed, but extremely, extremely happy with the way they played and um, against a very, very talented Leicester team. So you think that advantage was uh, <laughs> was handed to you, you think? What's your take on that, Darren? Uh, well, you know, I just think Mike's just obsessed with Man United, you know, I think. He just needs to get over. I know he's an Arsenal fan, but he's constantly just thinking about them. What are they doing? What's going on? You know, I just think deep down he has a dark secret that he doesn't want to admit to himself. And that's that he's a Man United fan. Um, look, it's good that it helped us have an advantage in the league. Uh, never happy to see Arsenal win. However, they deserve to win the game. Um, a big surprise, disappointing result for Leicester especially at home. Um, and I've been impressed by Pepe over the last few weeks. I think I think that this may be his first or second season in the Premier League. And 
uh, next season, I think if he can be a bit more consistent, then you'll see a really top player. I'm excited to see him develop as a player. Yeah, yeah I think, I think that, that exactly right, like... Darren. You mentioned it before with Rafinha at Leeds. It's those players that um, just bring the game alive and take on and do amazing things that, you know, it's outside the coach's structure almost, isn't it? They just use their natural flair and ability to take the game on, and it's so good to yeah. watch players like that. Yeah, yeah. I was talking to a coach just the other day about this, and we were discussing about the – the base of a team, the foundation of a team being their discipline and their defensive structure. And then when it comes into their offensive play, giving players a lot of freedom and creativity to be spontaneous and not actually coaching them how to attack and just letting them get into a flow state. So I think that what you're saying is is absolutely right. Giving players that license to be creative in the final third is is what it's all about. Yep. Yeah, and I, I, I do like in Pepe to Rafina that directness. They just literally go direct. It's not this messing around, passing out, passing. They just literally direct players, and I love it. And the flair that you just mentioned. Let's move on to a couple of games that were up were Spurs getting back on the win sheet, but admittingly not surprising against a Burnley team that I thought set up wrong. Mate Vidra, since he was in the championship and he moved up, has not done it for me. I would not have started Vidra. I definitely would have gone either to Chris Wood, who came on for Vidra in the 73rd minute. I'm glad they started Jay Rodriguez, but Vidra is just basically shooting blanks for me. Gareth Bale, who we've criticised a little bit, especially me, recently, um, he had some vindication. He got on the sheet in the second minute and then his brace in the 50, 55th minute. Kane scoring in the 15th minute and Lucas Mora, who at times has shown in the last few years some flashes of brilliance, the Brazilian. Um, listen, Spurs back on the winning run. They've started to try and establish a run. Do you think this is just temporary, guys, or do you think Spurs are still in trouble, Mike, on this one? Uh, personally, I don't care. I hate them. So <laughs> <laughs> that is evident. Any any Arsenal fan that would even even have any interest in Spurs has probably got to have check their heads. But what do you think to that, Darren? Do you think Spurs? Um, do you think Gareth Bale can? get some confidence back and you think this is just Burnley, so it's going to be 4-0? Or do you think Spurs can develop a, a, a winning run? You know, I just think Spurs now and also over the years have just been a flaky side. Like, when they get, when you just think they're starting to get some sort of consistency or get close to one in the league or doing something... Um, outside of finishing maybe fourth they just always seem to drop off and so I don't think it's going to change there with regards to Beal I would like to see him get more game time I think if he starts consistently he'll produce the goods but just looking at the game you've got Beal Mora Son Kane like their attacking players are fantastic it's just filling them in the system that that's going to suit all of them like if you're going to have Beal is the main man, then you might have to take out Son. So you know, it's it's a very, very difficult decision. Who is the main guy there? Because we don't know yet if it's we don't know if it's Kane, Beal, or Son. It's still that question needs to be answered. And I think the type of player Beal is, um, he needs to feel as if uh, he's he's number one, you know. Yeah, I agree with you. We talked about that before, and Mike brought that up when he was at Real Madrid and he wasn't necessarily positioned as the main man, um, that hits your confidence, you know, and, and maybe I was a bit critical and I think me and Mike were both critical of him. Let's see if they go on a winning run. Next up was Chelsea against Manchester United. And I have to say, um, I can't believe with the amount of shots on goal that it ended up nil-nil. Um you know, the only good thing for Chelsea is, you know, they dominated possession. They did have more shots on goal. 
but it's that lack of killer instinct in front of goal at times frustrates me. Not that I'm frustrated, not I'm, I'm wanting Chelsea to, to win because I'm a Leeds fan, but uh, they do have, they have been sort of rotating, you know, with mounts, keeping Werner on the bench, keeping Polisic on the bench and having this rotation. We talked about hudson Odoi being taken off in that one game. And then we, he started the next one. He started this game, uh, sorry, he... Um, he, he, yeah, he started this game, but he came off at half time. So I don't know if the manager is not showing patience with him, trying to give him an opportunity, but then he pulls him at half time again. So it's sort of weird. And Manchester United, I don't know. It's sort of frustrating that they should have, I thought, produced more up front and they really didn't do it for me. What was your, what's your take, Darren? Because obviously you're the Man U fan. What's your, what's your take? Yeah, I think Mike, you you just chipped in there with something. What what was that? No, I I, I was having the same exact same thought about Hudson Adoy, and then he they showed him at half time with a big ice um, pack on his knee, Ooh, so okay. he came off injured. Oh, I didn't okay. see that. Sorry, yeah. yeah, sorry. So that yeah. sort of explains that. So it's nothing to do with the situation from previous games. What? Thank yeah. you for pointing that out, Mike. What What was your take on the game, Darren? And uh, were you disappointed with a, a a draw or given Chelsea's run? of not losing a single match under two cal, do you think it's a fair result? A fair result? Yes, but it's not the type of result that we need to to finish second, you know, to because it's so competitive. And you see Manchester City, they really set the standard. I think it's 19 or 20 games in a row. It's... It's extraordinary, and they didn't even play. They didn't play well against West Ham. West Ham were the better team, mm-hmm. but they still came out with the result. Um, this game against Chelsea, this is a game that an Alex Ferguson's Manchester United team would have won. Um, not fantastically, not pretty, but they would have won it. And I think those wee differences are the key in in distinguishing between. Ferguson and, and the post managers after him. Uh, but with regards to Chelsea, I'm again, I said it last week, I'm really impressed by that new manager and the state of play and how he's changed it so quickly and the dominance that they now have in games. I do agree that he's a, he's a huge fan of rotation. He seems to really enjoy it. I don't huge think it's a, I don't think it's a reflection on, on the players and saying that he's taken them out because of performed well I think he's tr- still trying to find his best team and and but like you seen Pulisic um, earlier in the season once he has that run of form he'll start to do well so players I know don't really like it from my experience they, they just like to know what's going on so I'm sure it's going to take a while for them to adapt as well great points great points um, good game overall and then the last game on Sunday not surprising. Nobody here was expecting Sheffield United to beat Liverpool. To be honest with you, at half time, nil nil at half time, I thought Liverpool is looking not very good. They're not convincing me. And then, of course, Curtis Jones, 48th minute, and then an own goal. It took a Brian own goal to make it 2 0. Um, I'm not convinced that Liverpool's back on track. I'm not convinced at all. <laughs> Your thoughts if Liverpool are back on track first up, Mike, and then Darren, yeah? Yeah, I don't know if they're back on track, but I don't think they'll care, to be honest. I think they're, they've, they've broken the losing streak. They've got three points. You know, I think they'll use everything in their power to, to hang on that as a momentum shift. Fair enough, fair enough. And we saw, um, you know, the... The, the unusual pairing because of what happened to Henderson the last game we talked about last week he went off injured and so it's Phillips and Quebec as centre backs and that's okay for when you're facing Sheffield United that basically shoot blanks nearly every game um, if that has to be when you're going up against some quality sides in the next few games I'm concerned that Quebec and Phillips are your centre back pairings Darren yeah, absolutely. You're right. If they come up against an Aguero, you know, a Gabriel Jesus, um, you know, p- players of that caliber, uh, 
you're questioning the 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 quality of them. Um, so they still have a lot to prove. Um, and until they kind of have a dominant performance against players of that ilk, then they're not going to really convince uh, the supporters and and the club. And and so Liverpool do need a bit of investment in their defence. Yeah, and I think they'll get that. I think they'll spend quite a bit in the transfer window in the summer. There was only one other game up, uh, and that was on Monday. That you know, basically at least Monday uh, my time, not over in Melbourne, but. Everton, 1-0 winners at Southampton. Southampton really not on a great run lately. They're looking really bad, Southampton. What a great start to the year. And they've just gone into free fall. Everton's one of those up and down sides. I know uh, you respect them. Um, You've said that you like their manager, of course. But Richarlson with the winner in the ninth minute. They started Calvert-Lewin and Richardson and Sigurdsson up front. Southampton, for some reason, replaced Alex McCarthy and put Forster in goal, but it didn't help. They lose all three points. Everton gains three points. Top six right now. Manchester City, you mentioned this, Darren, walking away with it. They've played one more game, 27 games played. They played today. I didn't see the result. If they held, if they held that result while we're actually on this show, recording this show, it would be play 27, 20 wins, five draws, two losses, and 65 points. That's 15 points with one more game played than second place Manchester United, who have 50 points. Leicester in third, 49 points. West Ham in fourth, 45 points. Chelsea in fifth, 44 points. And Liverpool in sixth, 43 points. All played 26, with the exception of Man City. Arsenal, Mike's team, only six points back of sixth place in 10th place, 37 points, and Leeds, two points behind them in 11th. Uh, This is interesting because, as I said, Leeds have given up more goals than anybody else except West Brom and four sides have scored more. And Arsenal, really one of the best defensive sides, but they haven't scored more. Only four people, and all of the sides in the top six have scored more than Arsenal. So Arsenal really need to improve up front. If they could start scoring more up front, I think Arsenal have a chance to maybe at the end of the season creep into the top six. I think it will be a challenge for them. Thank you guys for coming on once again. Last word to each of you. And uh, thank you again for coming back. Mike. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, it was great to have Jordan on today and get that insight as well. Um, And pleasure talking to you guys. It's an interesting table. I think you take Man City off the plate. And you've got battles all the way from the, you know, you've got the top, what two to two to ten battling, and then you've got, you know, the, the, the bottom four or five battling. So it's an interesting year this year, and it's uh, exciting, which is what we love about football. Yeah, it's really exciting, and we're we're passionate about it. And Darren, yep, yeah, uh, really interesting to have Jordan on and get his perspective from someone who, you know, isn't a, a player or or manager and invested in teams in Europe and. Uh, just a quick word on the Premier League Man City running away with it um, you know Man United should get top four I'll, I'll I'll still stick with Everton getting top four I'd like to see them get top four West Ham doing outstanding and uh, and Fulham picking up a bit of form but but they need they need results to avoid relegation Thank you, guys. And again, thank you, as always. And we want to definitely thank Jordan for coming on. I thought it was insightful. Um, We'd love to have him back because I think he's got so much to share with our audience that uh, we could just do another show with him. And uh, we probably could have him back three or four times and still not get enough. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, We really appreciate you every week. Check us out, globalsportschannel.com. You can check us out podcasts. We're also available on iTunes and we'll see you next time. Take care guys. Thanks again. Cheers, David. Thanks, Mike. Cheers, Cheers guys. Mike. See you, Darren.